Thank you. So as James said, I'm Josephine. I'm a PhD candidate in the lab of Dr. Gordana Vanyak Nabakovic right now at Columbia University. And today I'm very excited to be sharing with you our work on tissue engineered autologous cartilage bone grafts for temporomandibular joint or TMJ regeneration. First, I'd like to set the stage with the clinical motivation behind this project. So the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research estimates that five to 12% of the population suffers from temporomandibular disorders or TMD, and that this is most prevalent in young people. So there are a range of causes behind TMD. Um, this can include everyday grinding or clenching of the teeth to the presence of arthritis in the TMJ to more serious things like cancer, trauma, or congenital anomalies, which will result in larger craniofacial defects. And all in all, TMD have a devastating impact on one's quality of life, um, particularly because they affect everyday activities like eating and speaking. And because they are so visible, they are also psychologically damaging. Therefore, these craniofacial defects need to be both functionally as well as aesthetically restored. The current standard of care for TMD can include some non-surgical treatment options such as behavior modification or steroid injections. But once these don't suffice, then we have to turn to surgical reconstruction to manage patient pain as well as restore joint function. So in the US, there are four FDA approved synthetic TMJ implants, which come from three different manufacturers. And one of these is the Zimmer Biomet um, stock prosthesis system, which is made from ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, as well as some cobalt chromium with titanium alloy. Um, another is the TMJ concept device, which is made from similar materials, but custom fit to each patient based on CT scans. Ultimately, these prosthetics will not recapitulate the native tissue mechanical and biological properties. And on the mechanical side of things, this will cause altered loading patterns, which can lead to negative long-term patient outcomes. And as I mentioned earlier, TMD is most prevalent in younger populations. So this becomes an especially important consideration here. And in addition to the altered loading patterns, surgeons are becoming increasingly concerned about um, metal hypersensitivity and allergy with patients. So while autologous bone transplants can sometimes be used, bone that's harvested from secondary sites, most commonly the iliac crest or proximal tibia, can result in these donor site comorbidities. And there's also going to be an inherent lack of workable starting material. So taken together, all of this makes TMJ reconstruction a good candidate for a tissue engineering approach. And in the field of craniofacial tissue engineering, I'd like to highlight two recent developments. First, we have a paper from Tony Mikos' group at Rice, which was published just last year. They created a mandibular defect in a sheep model and took advantage of the sheep as an in vivo bioreactor to help them generate new bone. On the other hand, we have a paper from our own lab from a few years back. And using a Yucatan mini pig model and an in vitro bioreactor approach, we engineered autologous bone grafts for reconstruction of the ramus condyle unit in the TMJ. And we chose to focus on this area of the TMJ in particular because it represents one of the most difficult challenges in craniofacial tissue engineering. This is in terms of its size, its anatomical complexity, as well as the load bearing requirement. So despite all this work, the gap still remains. In addition to bone, cartilage is going to be essential to recapitulating the full functional properties of the TMJ. The design requirements here will be similar, but now must be extended to cartilage. So we would like the graph to be anatomically customized, autologous, and functional, both in terms of uh, mechanically and biologically. This now brings me to the overall design of our study. So we continue to use skeletally mature Yucatan mini pigs um, because these are similarly matched to humans in terms of TMJ size and forces, which makes them a good preclinical model. And over the course of six weeks, we prepared the personalized components of the cartilage bone grafts for each animal. And then we assembled in vitro bioreactors to mature these dual tissue grafts over the subsequent five weeks. In order to mimic certain aspects of the manufacturing and transport chain that could be involved in clinical translation down the line, we then shipped our living grafts within their bioreactors from our lab in New York where they were grown to the surgical site in Baton Rouge where they were implanted in the animals. 
And these grafts remain implanted for six months before we explanted them to evaluate our cartilage bone grafts as compared to the native contralateral tissue in the TMJ and um, bone only grafts and acellular controls, which were also implanted for six months in vivo. Now I'd like to walk you through the process of how we actually engineered these grafts. First, to generate anatomically matched scaffolds, each animal receives a CT scan. And from those, we're able to generate the appropriate milling code for the scaffolds. The base material we start with are bovine femurs. And from these, we drill cylindrical cores, then mill the cores to the correct scaffold shape and put them through a series of decellularizing steps. And this decellularization process serves to remove any bovine components, which may induce an unfavorable immune response in the pigs later on. And we inspect the scaffolds for quality, particularly in terms of density and having avoided the growth plate region. And then we sterilize them before use. Um, in parallel, we also design PDMS pieces to go around the scaffolds perfectly, um, which fit inside the bioreactor chamber. And these are to ensure that flow will go only through the specified channels and through the tissue rather than around it. Next, on the cell side of things, we start by giving each animal a little bit of liposuction and harvest about 100 mils of fat. And from that fat aspirate, we're able to isolate autologous adipose derived stromal stem cells, or ASCs, and expand these to usable numbers by passage five. For the chondrogenic progenitors, we preform condensed mesenchymal bodies, and we press a layer of these pellets onto the condylar surface of the scaffold and then assemble the graft into its watertight bioreactor. In previous studies, we found that five weeks in our bioreactor is the ideal maturation time for these cartilage precursors, whereas three weeks is ideal for bone. Therefore, we wait two weeks after adding the chondrogenic layer before we seed the remainder of these ASCs throughout the ramus as osteogenic precursors. Finally, one of the key innovations that allowed us to simultaneously mature both cartilage and bone in a single graft was our dual tissue perfusion bioreactor. So this system includes the roller pump, media reservoirs, as well as the bioreactor culture chamber. And each bioreactor has two flow loops to allow for each tissue type to receive separate physical and chemical cues. So the cartilage and bone are exposed to their appropriate chemical cues in their respective media and each tissue can also see different physical cues as controlled by flow rate. For this study, we engineered a total of six cartilage bone grafts. And in addition, we included eight bone-only grafts as controls. So these grafts were seeded with the autologous osteogenic precursors and cultivated for three weeks in our single chamber bioreactors. And in comparison to the cartilage bone grafts, the bone-only grafts received no chondrogenic cells and had a slightly shorter bioreactor culture period. We also included three acellular scaffolds, which were similarly milled in an animal-specific manner based on CT scans and decellularized, but ultimately didn't receive any porcine cells and therefore did not necessitate the use of bioreactor culture. So after these grafts were allowed to mature in our in vitro bioreactors, we flew with them from New York to Baton Rouge for implantation at the Louisiana State University School of Veterinary Medicine. As you can see from the side-by-side -side comparison, which was taken um, during surgery, each engineered graft exactly matches the geometry of the native tissue that we're trying to replace. A team of maxiofacial surgeons from Columbia School of Dental Medicine implanted each of these grafts orthotopically in the corresponding animal, um, as shown by this post-op CT scan. And immediately after the anesthesia wore off from surgery, all animals were allowed to return to normal activities and consume solid food. And finally, the safety and procedure, the safety of the procedure as well as the biocompatibility of our grafts were confirmed by animal weights over the course of the study. Um, as well as daily weekday observations by the vets, and they saw normal walking, standing, eating, laying, and sleeping behaviors throughout the course of our study. After these six months in vivo, we then explanted our engineered tissues, as well as the corresponding native contralateral side of the TMJ. So macroscopically from these dissection pictures, we can see that the native cartilage tissue has good coverage across the condylar surface, as well as the characteristic sheen of healthy cartilage. 
The engineered dual tissue cartilage bone graft has that same sheen, and cartilage covers most of the articulating surface. In comparison, the bone only grafts, as well as the acellular scaffolds, fail to recapitulate either of these desired phenotypes. When we take a slightly closer look with pentachrome staining, we observe well organized layers in the native TMJ cartilage, in particular, the fiber cartilage layer covering on top and then underlying hyaline cartilage. And we see this recapitulated by the engineered cartilage with similar distribution of layer thicknesses. But in the bone only tissue, we see a lot more of the fiber cartilage and very minimal hyaline cartilage. And this becomes even more pronounced in the acellular group. We then took an even closer look at the composition of the cartilage um, by staining for some hyaline cartilage markers in the sagittal condylar plane, which is shown by the schematics in the bottom left. And we saw that Agrican, Runx2, and Sox9 were closer to native levels of expression in the cartilage bone group than in the bone only group. We performed additional IHC for collagen types one and two. So collagen one is the dominant component in fibrous cartilage. And this appeared most prominent in our bone only group and markedly less present in both the cartilage bone and native groups. On the other hand, collagen type two is known to be the primary solid component of hyaline cartilage, as well as the deeper zone mandibular chondrular cartilage. And these collagen two stains were comparably strong in cartilage bone and native groups, but then weaker in the bone only group. So taken together, we believe this could help explain the results of our OHP or hydroxyproline assay for total collagen content, which were performed on small local biopsies and showed no difference between groups. And similarly, our biochemical assay for GAG content indicated no significant difference between cartilage bone and bone only grafts, despite the more native like spatial distribution of proteoglycans in our cartilage bone group throughout the entire condylar plane. Um, which is what we saw earlier with the pentachrome staining. So overall, our engineered cartilage looked more native-like, but we also wanted to know if it recapitulated the appropriate function. We started by performing a 20-minute oscillating test against a cartilage counterface with the sample submerged in synovial fluid. And importantly, this testing was done on fresh um, and intact condyle. So we found that the cartilage bone group achieved consistently low friction coefficients with no significant difference from the native cartilage. And compared to the bone only group, both native and engineered cartilage had significantly lower friction coefficients. And I also will note that there was a larger standard deviation of the friction coefficients in the bone only group. And finally, these findings are supported by the presence of lubricin throughout our engineered cartilage. In addition, we performed compressive creep testing to determine the material properties of our cartilage. So we started by creating computational cartilage bone models with sample-specific geometry based on laser scans. And we also inputted sample-specific layer thicknesses based on the measurements from histology. Um, and these were used for inverse analysis and curve fitting of the raw creep data. So to measure Young's modulus, we measured on the peak of the entire condylar head while the sample was immersed in PBS under unconfined compression, a 0.03 Newton creep stop load for 20 minutes. And both cartilage bone and bone only grafts had similar Young's moduli and in the range of native tissues. But I'd also like to point out that the Young's modulus represents um, a bulk measurement of cartilage properties, which doesn't necessarily reflect differences in zonal organization between the groups that we've seen in some of our analyses thus far. So along that vein, if we look back at the relative layer thicknesses of the native samples, these were more closely matched by the cartilage bone group in which all zones show no significant difference from native than in the bone only or acellular groups in which all zones have p-values of less than 0.05. So I've spent the majority of this talk focusing on cartilage analyses, but now I'd like to briefly show some results from our engineered bone and focusing in particular on the subchondral bone region. Clinically, it's known that the subchondral bone plays some role in the initiation and progression of cartilage damage. And additionally, we know that the in vitro, in vitro formation of engineered cartilage is facilitated by the presence of bony matrix, even if it's decellularized. So in this study, we were interested to see if there was any reciprocal effect of the cartilage layer on the formation of our subchondral bone. Um, so I'll start with our Mason's trichrome staining, which showed a positive progression from 
the red, more osteoid heavy and immature bone tissue in our acellular implants to much more mature bone matrix in our cartilage bone grafts after spending six months in vivo. Um, we also stain for some common osteogenic markers by IHC. So with osteocalcin and osteopontin, the stains from the cartilage bone and bone only groups were similarly positive and comparable to native levels of expression. But for BSP or bone siloprotein, um, the cartilage bone and native samples appeared to stain similarly strong, whereas the bone only samples stained weaker. And finally, to investigate the role of our implanted cells in the development of these native like cartilage tissues, we had a subset of our graphs in which we seeded cells that had been transduced with fluorescent tags, um, specifically GFP. So after six months in vivo, we were still able to locate these cells in the explants using IHC. And we saw the chondrogenic progenitors at the very top of the condyle where they were initially seeded, as well as slightly deeper into the condyle. With our tagged osteogenic progenitors, we saw positive staining at several points throughout the scaffold, um, as shown at these three levels, but no more once you move past the scaffold bone interface into native bone. So I'd like to conclude um, by saying we designed a graft for regeneration of the TMJ, which included cartilage in addition to bone, and is patient-specific both anatomically and biologically. After spending six months in vivo, our engineered cartilage recapitulated key properties of native tissues. In particular, we saw cartilage which covered the entire condylar surface and with the appropriate zonal organization. Um, we saw appropriate expression and distribution of some key cartilage markers. And we found low friction coefficients, production of lubricin, as well as native physiological Young's moduli. On the bone side of things, after six months in vivo, our engineered subchondral bone in the cartilage bone dual grass showed some more native-like properties in terms of mature bone matrix as well as BSP expression. And finally, fluorescent tags indicated that the implanted cells were present and perhaps had, had a contribution to the regenerative process. So I'd like to thank everyone in my lab, um, including my co-author David, as well as Cordano, obviously, um, Kelsey Keith, John, Johnny, Aliyah, Mats, and Sophia, um, the lab of Dr. Gerardo Teshian for their help and expertise with our cartilage mechanical testing, uh, the lab of Dr. Ed Guo for their help with evaluating and characterizing our engineered bone, and Dr. Sid Isaac and his team for their clinical insight, as well as performing the surgeries, of course, Dr. Mandy Lopez and her team for the veterinary work, and Dr. Jeff Gimble and his team for isolation and characterization of our autologous ASCs. And finally, our funding support. And the work I presented today is coming out in Science Translational Medicine in two weeks on October 14th. So I hope you follow us on Twitter for updates and I also hope you give our paper a read. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine, that was brilliant. Congratulations on the paper. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, very fascinated is my own field of uh, osteochondral tissue engineering. I've got plenty of questions, but if you have any questions, then please uh, post them in the chat. Um, we have one from uh, Nicholas uh, Fisher who says TMJ uh, mandibular condyle is secondary fibrocartilage, so unlike hyaline articular cartilage from other axial sites. So, does this affect your cartilage design or the source of the cells that you use? Um. So I touched on at the end, like what is this question about what is the role of our implanted cells in regenerating tissues? And there's some data I didn't show in this talk, but our data really shows that the cells and the scaffold that we implanted serve more as a template for regeneration rather than the actual um, basis of regeneration. So for example, we created smaller constructs which never got implanted in the animals and analyze them at the end of bioreactor culture and we've previously published um, on only having done this with a cartilage precursor and underlying bony matrix and then with bone alone um, and all of this supports it's really the animals doing a bulk of the work for in vivo regeneration we're just providing like a good template for it um, no i think that's a, that's a very good clarification thank you um we have, oh, well, we've got a bunch of questions coming in. Um, so uh, Alexandra says, uh, did you evaluate whether the graft material degraded at all during the six month period? Um, 
So I'm assuming the graph material is referring to the decellularized bone scaffold, which was then recellularized in some of our groups. Yes. Um, we didn't see... So we also performed some micro CT, which again, I didn't see here, as well as um, CT. And we see with tetracycline labeling that there is new bone turnover, but I would say a large part of our scaffold, just based on what we saw at um, explantation, is still very distinguishable from the native bone. Um, so I would say there's some turnover, but it's not fully replaced after six months. No, that's, that's fine, thank you. Um, uh, we have a question from Chang who says, great talk. So what key specific goals are you trying to achieve, um, maybe in comparison to the previous published work? Um, so the previous published work was really just our bone only ramus condyle unit TMJ graphs. Um, so the main goal of this study was to see if we could include both cartilage as well as bone in a functional and patient specific way, um, which is why I presented so much cartilage data. And I would say in a lot of ways, we saw really nice cartilage. Um, and the bone could certainly be improved, but that was not the main goal of this study. No, and I think you um, very nicely showed that the cartilage had some very nice functional benefits. So, um, uh, Garima says, uh, "What would the additional what would um, what additional alterations would be needed in the proposed therapy to test uh, or use it in a clinical setting?" Yeah. So. I will say first that the bone only work um, in the craniofacial tissue engineering space has been spun out into a startup at bone, which is currently in phase one, two um, clinical trials in humans. And as far as this, I think one of the considerations is the timeline for how long it takes to prepare our graphs. Um, and that's largely limited by using patient-specific cells. So we need to collect a fat aspirate from the specific individual and then expand these cells and put them into the graph. So our timeline matches pretty well with what our clinical collaborators have told us as far as um, people who would need two surgeries. Um, our timeline fits into that, but if we for some reason want to create an off-the-shelf therapy, then um, I think something that needs to be validated is we know MSCs and similarly ASCs have some level of immune privilege. So are we able to create like more off the shelf cell sources and then create graphs from these and would they have an immune response in these patients? Um, and also this study was conducted in healthy animals. So I think more validation would be to be done if there was an unhealthy joint environment, which these patients often have. Um, also our animals were relatively young. So I think uh, the donor age of the cells may matter. Um, and one more consideration, all our animals were male, so maybe sex-based differences. Um, they find that TMD is more prevalent in young women in particular, so that could be an important consideration here. Uh, I think those are all very, very valid points. Um, I think the, the environment in, in maybe an arthritic um, situation would could potentially cause some problems there. So um, uh, Torres, I think it is, uh, says, great work, Josephine. Uh, did you and co-authors look into whether the construct uh, integrated into the native um, surroundings uh, and how was that quantified? So I actually had similar questions. We're looking at the histology that you presented. I couldn't sort of understand whether it was a beautifully integrated system or whether you were just showing the, um, the, the scaffold there. Yeah, so most of the histology I showed was from the condylar region, which kind of stands alone. It doesn't have so much like native bone that it needs to integrate with. Um, and I will say most of our work characterizing the native to engineered bone interface was um, published in the previous iteration of this project in 2016. Um, so, Basically, I'll say like we could definitely improve on the bone integration. Um, we didn't attempt to do so in this study, 
I would say we reached similar levels of phone integration as what we saw in our previous work, um, despite the addition of cartilage. Uh, thank you. Um, I think I've got a chance to ask some of my questions now. So um, can you speak a little bit more into the um, into the assembly of the, um, the cartilaginous um, uh, layer onto the, the, the bone graft? And did you see any kind of instabilities um, um, in, in that layer? Did you see any delamination um, in, in, that, in those two layers? So with the cartilage layer assembly, um, we first preform these mesenchymal bodies, condensed bodies, or like chondrogenic pellets. Um, and then we harvested all the pellets and essentially pressed them onto a membrane and then pressed those onto the scaffold. And we would let the scaffold um, run at a very low perfusion rate and sort of upside down, so with the condyle on the bottom, um, for the two weeks prior to adding the bone. Um, and by that point, I would say the layer is pretty stable. We don't really see delamination. Uh, I don't know if you noticed in our surgical picture, but the side-by-side -side comparison, you can see, um, maybe I can go back to it now. You do see these like ridges, um, which is where the membrane to uh, perfusion channel interfaces, but that is no longer visible after the six months. Sure. Um... So then how do the, how, what, what are the sort of um, stresses, the mechanical stresses um, involved in the TMJ compared to say the knee, for example? Is it a um, less mechanically stressed environment? Um, I think in terms of maybe magnitude of forces, yes, but in terms of frequency of usage and how many load cycles you undergo a day, um, it's one of the most loaded joints sure. and we don't really think about it because it's such a like small movement that we take for granted in these everyday activities um and i think one of the more interesting things about the tmj is that it's like all connected so both sides really need to be well matched um and also the loading pattern is like a combination of different forces rather than in uh, like a more simple loading pattern than the knee no, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, well, I'll just ask one more question. So um, how, how does then the, the, the loading regimes that you used for your um, shear and your compression testing, how does that compare to the sort of physiological loading regimes? Um, so we try to keep it, we try to keep the testing conditions as physiological as possible. Um, in terms of the friction testing, for example, we used synovial fluid to mimic the joint space as well as a uh, cartilage strip for the articulating surface. Um, and for both friction and compression, I think one of the key things was keeping the entire condyle intact rather than doing like a biopsy or a sample and testing only that small region. Um, and we tried to perform the test on like the peak of the condyle rather than some other region. Um, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I think we've run out of time. So um, thank you for answering those questions very, very comprehensively. And thank you for a great talk. So I'm going to hand over now to Natalie, who's going to introduce our second speaker.